Praise the Lord, brethren. Uh, karibuni sana uh, for the Sunday service. This wonderful morning, we want to thank God for the opportunity to be able uh, to share the word of God, to receive God's word. And today, I'm, I'm so thankful to God for the opportunity uh, to be able to share the word of God. My name is Elder Peter Kenaro, and I'm an elder at God's Mercy's Tabernacle. And so it's a privilege and always an honor to be able to uh, share uh, the word of God. Uh, and I want to welcome you to this, pro, uh, to this program and this uh, teaching for the day. I want to, uh, first of all, begin with a word of prayer, and then we shall be able to get into the topic for this day, uh, and God is going to bless us. Father, in the name of Jesus, may you be glorified, may you be exalted. We want to thank you, Lord God Almighty, because of your word, because your word has transformative power to renew our minds, to change us, into your image and to the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. For Lord God Almighty, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our pathways, O God. And we want to thank you, my God, because of every one of us that is joining and even those of us who are hearing this message, O God, here. Lord, we want to commit, O God, each and every person to you. We pray that, Lord, this word shall be planted in each and every one of, uh, of our hearts to be able to bear and to yield the fruit of the Spirit of God. Therefore, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to take charge and control of this, uh, uh, of this sermon. May you be glorified. May you be exalted. We welcome you. We honor you. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So today, uh, I want us to uh, learn from the word of God, from the book of uh, uh, 2 Timothy, chapter, in particular, chapter 3 but also looking uh, uh, more specifically at chapter 2, verse 15, and chapter 3, verse 16, those two uh, verses. Uh, and so I want us to, uh, so that we can be able, the topic is about rightly dividing the word of God. We are called to rightly di divide the word of God, and this is a call that Paul, as he was writing uh, this uh, book, uh, Second Timothy, it's the last book that uh, is known that uh, Paul uh, wrote before he was he was decapitated uh, and put to death. Uh, so as he was, he's actually giving the last instructions to the church, and in particular how we are to handle the word of God and what is uh, is required of God's servants as they share the word of God that they are required to do it and, and, and handle the word of God with a lot of care and also with accurately. And that is why I want us to look at, first of all, uh, second, uh, why is the word of God so important? And why is it equally important for God's servant to rightly divide the word of God or to carefully handle that word? Because in the word of God, the Bible is telling us in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3, verses uh, 16, which is what I want us to read first. Uh, from the King James Version, it says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That is God's word. That scripture, as we know it, is given directly by the inspiration of God. Men wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. And that is what we have today in this book called the Bible with 66 uh, books. And so this uh, word is given by four hours. Why is it given? First of all, it is given through the breath of God. That is the Spirit of God. And, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ clarifies and says that the words he speak to us, they are spirit, and not only spirit, but they are life. In the book of John, chapter 6, verses, uh, verses uh, John chapter 6, verses 63, that the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. So the word of God is life-giving. The word of God is, 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 is a spirit. And that is why we are seeing that in, the, in, in, in this scripture, 
2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 that scripture is God breathed. The NIV is uh, translated as God breathed or rather it is given by the inspiration is from the breath of God or from the spirit of God and it is profitable or useful for that matter for, for teaching us for instructing us, for rebuking us, for correcting us, and for teaching in righteousness. So the only way that we can be able to, to be righteous, that is in right standing with God, or on the side of God, if we want to be right standing with God, the word of God trains us. It is able to instruct us so that we can be able to know God's will. And God's will is his word. The will of God is contained in the word of God. And in the word of God is the will of God. So for us to be able to know God's will, for us to be able to know what he requires of us, it is important that we are able to know his word. And so it is given by the inspiration of God. And so... He goes ahead, uh, we go back to chapter 2, that is 2 Timothy chapter 2, whereby he says in verse 15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that, need, that needs not to be ashamed, to be ashamed rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. So here scripture tells us, that we are to study the word of God so that we can, be, we can be able to show ourselves, to present ourselves as people who are approved by God. And so it is important that as we handle God's truth, first of all, God's word, to know that it is the word of truth. It is the word of truth and it must be rightly divided or carefully handled to rightly divide is directly uh, means that you have to as you are as you are, as you are, as you are teaching the word of god as you are teaching the word of god you have to rightly cut it or dissect it why is it important so that everything is in a proper context you have to handle everything in the proper context. And when you do that, so that is the only way that you'll be able to understand God's word. So God's word is, is important. So, so important. And this word is what the enemy is fighting. When I talk about the enemy, I talk about the, I'm talking about the enemy of our souls. That's the devil. And so why is it so, so important? Uh, uh, it's, it's imperative for every soul, every living soul, every man and woman to be able to understand and to read and to study God's word. Because it is by the, the, the word of the Lord, the heavens were made from the book of Psalms, from the, right from Genesis chapter 1. God spoke and when he spoke, it manifested Whatever he spoke manifested physically. The world as we know it was created. The earth was created. The earth and the heavens were created by the word of God. So when you look at a scripture like for example, Psalms 33. Let's go there to Psalms 33. So that we can be able to see how the power that is in God's word. Psalms 33 verses 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Everything that we see on earth was created by God's word. So God's word has creative power. It has power to change. It has power to transform. It is by the word of God when he spoke it came to be. And if you go down further to verse 9, it says, For he spoke and it came to be. 
he commanded and it stood firm. That is the power of God's word. And this is one of the biggest if there is anything that the enemy fights is for you to know God's word. He wants you to remain ignorant of the word of God or better still to reject it totally. These are, the whole scheme is to get you to reject God's word. And if he cannot get you to reject the word of God, he will cause you to, be, to remain ignorant. If he's not able to cause you to be ignorant, then he has another scheme, and that is to deceive to misrepresent the facts so that when you read the word of God, he is able to deceive you. And this is one of his oldest tactics and the chief weapon of the enemy. Right from the Garden of Eden is deception to deceive you. If he can get you to deceive, that is because he knows the word of God is the truth. That's why we are being told to rightly divide the word of truth. And like you have said, that it means being able to correctly interpret, to correctly divide, is to cut with precision, to dissect like a surgeon. And so it is the same thing that when you are talking about dissecting God's word, we have to rightly handle it so that we don't misinterpret it, so that we don't, so that we are able to also carefully instruct others. You cannot just read the word of God out of context. And this is now where deception creeps in. Because he knows that the enemy will know that this word, it is the creative power behind. The, the, behind everything that is living. All of God's creation was created by the word of the Lord. And it is important when we, we are talking about the word, as you study the word, that means you have to read the Bible in context. And you have to read the word knowing that it is one whole book. That what you find in Genesis when the Bible says that, when the Bible says, you see, for example, in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning was, the, was God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. <coughs> and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. So here we see God the Father. Then we see the spirit of God hovering over the waters. And then we encounter the word of God. He spoke and it was done. And you need to know that the word of God is a person. The word of God is a person. How do you know it's a person? Because Bible interprets itself from scripture to scripture. When you come to the book of John chapter 1, verses 1, you get to understand that indeed the word of God, which is the word of truth, is a person. And it says in verse, in verse 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So the word becomes a he, and he was with God in the beginning. And it says in verse 3, Through him, the person of the word, through him, were all things, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. So you get to understand as you study this word that indeed the word of God is a person. And it continues to say, verse 9. <clears throat> uh, 
that the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And this is the word of God, which is the life in him, which, that you have just seen that in him was life, and that life was the light of men. So he says, verse 10, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was, which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Because through the word of God was man, was, were men made. Man was made through the word. God spoke. He breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul. But when the word came and dwelt amongst us, we did not recognize him. This is simply what he's saying. And as you continue to read, he says in verse 12, but as many as received him, he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed in his name. So you see, he has a name. The word of God, which is not just the word, was life. And this word is the light for men. But when he came to his own, his own did not recognize him. And then he says in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among, among us. <coughs> we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And now you can begin to understand who we are talking about. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was the one, this was he of whom I said, he, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only in caps, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And that is the revelation of who the word of God is. Jesus Christ is the word of God. And it is through him that everything we have was made. And that is why as many as received him, he gave the power to become children of God. Because God's word, in God's word, there is power, transformative power. It has creative force behind it to change and transform anything that comes to encounter the word of God. And for you to be able to receive this power, you have to believe in the one and only who came from the Father and is now at the right hand of the Father. That means you have to believe in Jesus Christ. That is why when you go a little bit further in chapter 14, Jesus identifies himself and says, I am the truth. John chapter 14. I am the truth. He says in John chapter 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is only by the knowledge of God's word, knowledge of knowing the word of God, that you can be able to know the truth. Because Jesus is the truth, and he is the way, and he is the life. But this is the whole purpose of the contention. The enemy does not want you to know this precious James, this precious treasure that we have right before us. And so, people, servants of God have a responsibility to rightly and accurately interpret God's word. They are supposed to correctly handle it. Because in this word, any person who encounters this word, the word of God is useful 
it is profitable to train everyone in righteousness. And so the enemy has deployed tactics so that this word will not be known because the word of God is the truth. And so the battle that we have today is a fight against truth. And that is why we are seeing the rise of deception. Deception began right in the Garden of Eden. But the enemy has deployed very many tactics today to get you, to keep you ignorant, to keep you distracted, to keep you not having the knowledge of truth. <coughs> he has deceived many. He will use deception. That means presenting something that is like the truth. But it is actually presenting a lie. He's the father of lies. So he'll present a lie as if it is the truth. That is the whole purpose of deception. And so today we have a problem. If you do not study God's word, and that is what the servant of God is being inst is instructing, is being instructed here by uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15, that you have to study to show yourself, yourself approved as a servant of God. You have to study the word of God. That means you have to take time to diligently study the word. And this will make you, when you know the word of God, you will be able to understand God's will. You will be able to not just to know the will of God, but you will be able to receive instructions for your life. The word of God will train you in righteousness. The word of God will reprove you, that is to rebuke. So that you know what I have done is wrong. You will be convicted by the word of God. And so a lot of Christians today, their purpose, in as much as you are many, are, 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 are saved, but they are not delivered. A lot of Christians are saved, but they are not delivered from a sinful lifestyle. That is why you have to study the word of God to rightly divide it. And because when you rightly divide, it will give you the perspective of God. You'll be able to have God's viewpoint of yourself <clears throat> and of his purpose over your life. You'll be able to understand his will. <coughs> You'll be able to be equipped to fight against sin, to overcome temptations, to overcome the schemes of the enemy. When you rightly divide the word of God, you will be delivered. And you'll be able to rightly, to have right thinking, because when you are thinking right, you will also produce right actions. It is so, so important. This can only happen to that person who is taking time to study the word. And so, the fight that you have today is to survive deception. As Christians, many have been compromised because they are not reading the word. They are not taking time to study the word. And this is what happens. The Bible is telling us, the book of 1 Peter, that we have everything that we need in the word of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life. Whatever you need for life and godliness, through our knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. God's divine power, that is the spirit of God, who comes to dwell in a believer. The minute you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to see Jesus at night and he told him in the book of John chapter 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That means you have to be born from above. 
When you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you are born by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes to dwell in you. He comes to dwell in you. And so these, these are the things that the enemy does not want you to know. You are sealed for the day of redemption. The Bible is telling us the Holy Spirit has sealed us. And that is why when he comes to live in us, when we don't study the word of God, we grieve him. Because the Holy Spirit works together with the word. If you don't allow the word of God to richly dwell in your heart, as the scripture is instructing us in the book of Colossians, that we have to allow scripture to dwell in our hearts richly. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of God dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. Lest you'll fall to deception. And not just deception, which will cause you to believe a lie. Something that is actually a lie. It will also, the enemy will also corrupt the world. He corrupts the word. And by corruption, that is perversion of something from its original uh, version, from its original state. When you corrupt something, that means you have perverted that something from its original state. And that is what scripture is telling us. Ignorant of God's word will lead to perversion. It will lead to corruption of the word. Second Peter, I repeat again, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who, ha, who called us by his own glory and goodness. So the knowledge of, of, of him, that is the knowledge of God's word, whom we have seen that actually the word is a person, Jesus Christ. We know the truth. And when we know Jesus... We will know the truth and the truth will set us free. The truth of Jesus. When we know Jesus, when we understand him. John chapter 8 verses 32. That when you will know that, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let's, let's begin from that verse 31 to get the right context. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free from what? From the bondage of sin. Remember, we have a deceiver. One who comes to pervert God's word, to corrupt it. His purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is the ultimate purpose. And so the enemy moves around like a roaring lion to devour the truth, to change the truth. Yet you cannot change. The truth is a person. It is important for us to know that Jesus, his purpose on earth was to reveal the truth because he himself is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is a person. And there's a difference between truth and facts. Facts can be changed by the truth. That is why when Jesus came to earth, he delivered many from sin. Many were demon-possessed. It was a fact that many were sick. But in as much as they were sick, he was able to change that sickness by healing them. So the word of God is so powerful. It is not only the creative force that gives life or brings to life. It is able to change the order of things because the word is a person who is the truth. And he is able to change. A doctor can only treat you when you are sick. That's a fact. 
but he has no power to heal. It is only truth that can heal because truth is a person. And when that truth is spoken by faith, the servants of God are able to change the order of things. That's why Peter was able to walk on water because he, his focus was on Jesus. But the minute he removed his, he shifted his focus from Jesus, he began to sink. The minute he doubted, and he looked around, and this is what the enemy wants to do, to cause you to focus, to change your focus from God to yourself, to the circumstances around you, so that you lose focus and sight of God. And whom we are being told, through him, we have, he has given us everything we need for life. Verse 4 says, through this he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We are able to escape the benefits of knowing God's word. We are able to escape the corruption of the world. By knowing God's word, we know the truth. <coughs> and the truth is not true. The truth is a person. The truth is unchanging. Truth does not change. These are facts about truth. The truth is living because truth is a person of Jesus Christ. Truth is absolute. It does not change. Remains the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The word of God does not change. God wants you to live a holy life. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And so, what are the schemes of the enemy? The schemes is, a, is to attack the word of God. To cause you to shift your focus from God's word. So that because you will lack knowledge. And when you don't have knowledge, you begin to look for knowledge elsewhere. You begin to put your trust to yourself. The enemy actually wants you to look to yourself. To trust in your abilities. So that you can take pride in your achievements. And one of the things that the enemy does is when he can get us to shift our focus from God, then he has, he, has, he has us where he wants. That's why for Jesus, it was very, he knew when the enemy came attacking him to tempt him, he never changed his focus from the word. He did not. The enemy wanted Jesus to look to himself. That when he came tempting him, <clears throat> It says, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And how did Jesus reply? Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He took him to the word. It's not about me. It's not about my abilities. It's not about what I can do or not do. It is about God. It is about his word. What does it say? And so the devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus said it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is written. He was able to destroy the attacks of the enemy by the word of God. So the word of God is a weapon. That's why we are saying you, it keeps you for battle. To overcome sin, to overcome temptations, to overcome, you, are not, you cannot be deceived because you know the truth. And the truth will set you free. 
So the battle is against the word. This is where the enemy has launched the most vicious attack to get you ignorant or distracted. And so today it's, an, it's a tragedy that so many people are ignorant of God's word. <coughs> and it is for this reason they are destroyed. <coughs> Excuse me. That is from the book of Hosea, chapter 4. That my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. <coughs> my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will ignore your children. That is how serious it is. When you reject knowledge, when you are, when you are, <coughs> when you reject knowledge, you are rejecting God in your life. And this is what it is today. First of all, the enemy, the devil was kicked out of heaven because of pride. Because what pride wants to take, uh, to, to have an entitlement that this is mine, this is my achievement. So that you want to take pride even for giving to God. There's nothing you can give God. We are so unworthy. We are so, so unworthy. And there is nothing that we can give to God. We are saved by grace. And so all false religions, all false religions, they want to make you take some pride in your, in, in your achievements. That you have to be able to do something to God for him to bless you. It's not like that. Salvation is by grace alone. That is an unmerited favor. It's not about the number of times you pray. You cannot earn your way to heaven. It has been given to us freely. And so, we receive from God freely. We give freely. We know that you have received freely. We know that there is nothing we can do to gain salvation, to gain eternal life. We are so unworthy before God. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. And so God does not want us to take pride. That's why he, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So the enemy will want to get you to worship yourself or to worship an object. That's why the enemy wants you to believe that Jesus is not enough, that the word of God is not enough. This word is enough for our salvation. We only need to believe. And the word, together with the Holy Spirit, produces faith. And now when we develop faith, that is coming to agreement with the word of God and living according to what the word says, the requirements of the word, that's obedience. Those are the actions that we produce by faith. So the word must work together with the spirit of God or else we'll be grieving the Holy Spirit. And when we grieve the Holy Spirit, look at what happens. The Bible is, we are instructed not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4. That verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. How do we grieve the word of God? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. One of the primary targets of the enemy is the enemy will prey on your emotions so that if he can play around with your emotions, he can get you to be angry, to be sad, 
to be depressed, if he can get you and play around with your emotions, he knows <coughs> that he has made you shift your focus from God to yourself. So that, because in the word of God, if we are focused on God's word, we have no reason to be depressed. We have no reason to be angry. We have no reason to be moody. We have no reason to be anxious and fearful. <coughs> so he preys on your emotions. He will also prey on your attitude. He will attack your attitude, your state of mind. So that the way you react, your thoughts, he attacks your thoughts. And all this is to cause you to shift focus from God to yourself or to other things that are around you. That's why all false religions, they worship some objects. <clears throat> they want to put their faith. Jesus is not enough. You must have some relics, some objects that you are bowing down to. You must, there are some requirements, some certain actions, some rituals that you are required to undertake so that you can be able to be good enough. You cannot be good enough for God. The only way that you can be good enough for God is when you have Christ in you, soaked by the blood of Jesus, washed by the blood, so that when God looks at you, he sees his son. You are forgiven because you have received Jesus Christ and you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Apart from the blood of Jesus, we are unworthy and condemned. So, there is a, an attack on the word so that we don't rightly divide it. And one of those, uh, for example, when we don't rightly divide the word of God, we will be deceived. The word of God will be corrupted. And that is what we are seeing today. A rise of false teachers. One of the greatest signs of the coming of Christ is when the disciples ask the Lord, what will be the sign of your coming? In the book of Matthew chapter 24, the disciples came to him. They wanted to know what will be the sign of the end of the age. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this thing, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. One of the things that the enemy does not want you to know is the coming of Christ. If you don't rightly divide the word of God, you will misinterpret the word of God. You will misinterpret. This is exactly what happened to the Jews. They did not know that the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah, the promised Messiah, was twofold. He was first of all coming to pay the price of sin on the cross, to die on the cross. <coughs> Talking about the physical coming of the Messiah was twofold on earth. He came the first time to die on the cross. And he was coming a second time. And that is his coming to restore his kingdom on earth. Now when you don't rightly divide the word of God, you will not interpret it correctly. Because the book of Isaiah chapter 28 is telling us that for, it, for precept must be upon precept. 
That is rule upon rule. Line upon line. A little here and a little there. That means you have to read the entire word of God to gain understanding. You will not know about the second coming. The second coming has also as in faces. And this is one of the greatest deception on earth. The greatest deception on earth is about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. His second coming. Because it is in faces. Just the same way that the old prophets were only, they were looking ahead. They knew the Messiah was coming. And so the children of, when the Jews, when Jesus came, they expected him to come and establish the kingdom. And that is why the disciples now who have understood are asking this question. Because now they have known that he's, he was coming, first of all, with a deep, different purpose. And that is the problem. Another major problem is that when you don't rightly divide the word of God, you have said when you rightly divide the word of God, it will produce right thinking, and right thinking will produce right actions, and right actions will produce righteous living. Being right with God. Rightly dividing the word of God will also help you to understand God's purpose over your life and the life of others. And the enemy does not want you to know your purpose. How do we know our purpose? When we study the word of God, the word of God is telling us to pray. When we pray, he fulfills his purpose. He reveals his purpose. And he is able to fulfill it in our lives. So there are requirements. The word of God is telling us to pray without ceasing. When you are ignorant of that, you will only be praying when you have a problem. Not knowing that you are required to pray every now and then. And so, the greatest deception, I'm talking about the second coming is in faces. We see that there is Jesus. First of all, you have been sealed for the day of redemption. God has given us the Holy Spirit of God as you have read in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, 30. For the day of redemption. God is coming to receive his own. And this one is very clear in the book of second, first and second Thessalonians. For example, another sign that we see, <coughs> Second Thessalonians chapter, Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let's read from the book of F, uh, this, uh, King James. That. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you, that you be not shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except they are come are falling away fast. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. That word, this is where we get the word apostasy. And the word apostasy, the original Greek word apostasy or apostasia has two meaning. That is to forsake or to depart. To forsake or to depart. And that is why it is so important to study the word richly. And you realize that those two words are applicable here. They are applicable. That the gathering of the saints, this is what he's talking about. That there is a gathering of saints 
And as that gathering of saints, what we know and call the rapture of the church. That day is not coming until, first of all, we see there has to be a, an apostas, a forsaking of the faith, and a departing. And we, as we continue to see, you gain context that in verse, uh, verse 6, that we have seen that the man of sin will be revealed, whom we know as the Antichrist. But he will not be revealed, first of all, until the apostasy takes place. And, and it continues to tell us that in verse 6, and now you know what is holding him back. That is the revelation of the Antichrist or the man of sin. So that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it, holds him back, will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. There is a restraining force, a restrainer that is restraining the revelation of the Antichrist. But when he's taken out of the way, when the occurs a departing, a departure, the man of sin will be revealed. So, and this is not talking about, and from that time, we will see the world falling into the hands of the Antichrist. And when you go to the book of Daniel, it tells that, that he is going to form a treaty with Israel of seven years. That is Daniel chapter 9 verses 27. It says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, that is seven years. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation <clears throat> until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So this sets the stage, the abomination. You can know very well the coming of the Messiah, the second coming will be seven years after the revelation when the Antichrist enters into a covenant with Israel for seven years the second coming will be eminent and it will be known. What, it is not, what, what is not known is the day that Jesus is revealed to receive his bride. And when I say so, his, coming for two, his second coming is in two phases. First of all, to receive his bride, the church of Jesus Christ, and also the second coming, to, he comes on earth the second coming where every eye will see him to restore the kingdom. So if I can read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air so that we will be with the Lord forever. The enemy wants you to be ignorant of this so that you don't focus on the coming of the Messiah or being gathered to Christ. He wants you to be ignorant so that you, this is misinterpreted. People are not aware that you are supposed to stay ready, prepared, we are supposed to be without to live a holy life. And so we have all manner of deception in terms of corruption of the world. The focus has shifted from God. The enemy wants you to focus on the world. The here and now. So that we have teachers that are teaching a gospel that is not the true gospel. We have seen an apostasy, that is a defection from the faith. We have seen heresies. That is corrupting again the word of God. Uh, 
That is something that is contrary to the known doctrine. Suppression of truth. If there is any time in our, in, in our lifetime that you have seen such a great suppression of truth is today. People want to change the order of God. People want to change and suppress the truth. That is, they know the truth, but they want to keep it, to, to lock it, to press it down so it is not known. And that is what you see. This is one of the reasons why God's wrath shall be revealed. Romans chapter 1, verses 18. <coughs> Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. And he continues in verse 20, 22. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Have you ever seen people how foolishly today? How foolish can you be to think that you're a man, you can become a woman? Or you're a woman, you can become a man? Not even the, the smallest child. They know as a child as they grow up, they know the difference between a man and a woman. That you have even nations now passing laws about the rights of such people to express themselves. These are abominations before God that has, are going to cause the wrath of God to be revealed from heaven. And so verse 26 says, verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations, relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind, a reprobate, to do what ought not to be done. That is a modification of the mind so that you are no longer thinking correctly. And so today we have seen all these perversions that are taking place in the world around us. It is what Isaiah prophesied and said about a time that will come. Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet. And sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. It is only through the word that we get to know the truth. But then he wants you to, de to shift focus from God, to distract you with the technologies of today, to introduce a false doctrine, a false teaching, so that you can get to to when you shift your focus to yourself, to even worship your desires. This is what is happening today. Men have become lovers of themselves. Second Timothy chapter 3, it says, but mark this, there will be terrible or perilous time in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. People are no longer thankful. They are no longer thankful to God for life. They want to have a sense of entitlement. That you even think that God owes you blessings. And that is why today there is a perversion of truth 
a blessing mentality. There are people are only following God with their arms open like this to receive blessing. As if God will love you regardless of how you live your life and bless you. Regardless of your sinful lifestyle. That is not God. That is not Jesus. That is another Jesus. Jesus is holy and righteous. He does not tolerate sin. A corruption of truth. Today love is love. Love has been made to be a feeling. That's not the truth. Love is forgiving. And we are told uh, the Bible describes what love is. Is tolerant. Does not keep a record of wrongs. It is kind. It is not rude. Love is merciful. Love is not living the way you want. It's not a feeling. It's a command from God. So, this is what is happening. Men have introduced, they have a sense, a form of godliness. Look at this. Without love and forgiving, slanderers, that is continuation of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 3. Without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having, have nothing to do with them. People are so wildly minded. And we are called to be shift our minds on things above, not on earthly things. Because whatever we see is coming to an end. The flesh counts for nothing. And so people talking about lovers of themselves. That's why the social media is awash with people idolizing themselves. God, that is an idolatry. There is nothing you can do. Don't look for men's approval. Look for approval of God. So to present yourself out there so that you can get likes. These are detestable things and a pity and a show that you have not known God. We are unworthy before God. And so in the last days, again, the Bible is saying, not just terrible times will come like we have just read. We also see that the Spirit clearly says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that in the latter time, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. Such teachings come from hypocritical liars whose conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. That is the order of religion today. And that is not of God. Chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. It's a fallacy. And it is all coming to naught. Shift your focus your mind on God, on the word of God, Jesus Christ. This is a word. This word has power to change you, to break the yokes of the enemy. It is an offense. You can have faith, which is a shield, but the word of God is a sword of the spirit. Proclaim it. Speak it out loud. Decree. And it has transformative power to change your thoughts, to change your lifestyle, so that when this word is working in you, it will work in you to act and will according to the will of God. Your mind can never remain the same when you encounter the word of God. Your thoughts must change so that you want to think in alignment. To your right thinking will be produced because the word is renewing your mind. It is regenerating. There is a regenerating power that is in the word because this word created the heavens and the earth. It is also going to change you as long as you stay in the word. You study it diligently from page to page, from Genesis to Revelation. Study the word 
and you will know the truth. And Jesus said that the truth will set you free. It will break the yokes of slavery, the yoke of bondage. It set the captives free. Those who are in bondage are liberated. It brings light in the darkness so that your emotions now are stabilized. It brings joy. It gives you wisdom. And I want to finish with the book of, let's look at Proverbs chapter 8 and Psalms 19. Verse 10 says, verse 8, verse 7, my mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just, none of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are faultless to those who have knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than the choice of gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies. And nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. By me, kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. By me, princes govern and all the nobles who rule the earth. I love those who love me and those who seek me will find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the path of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasures full. This is where you get wealth. Knowledge, understanding, discretion, discernment, prudence. You live a life that is just. You get to know that the possessions are not important than God. Earthly possessions, they are useless. You know that it is by grace alone. You don't deserve anything. You know that I can have nothing but possess everything, like Paul said. Owning nothing yet possessing everything. Jesus did not own big cars, lived in big houses, big estates, walk like a king in chariots. But whenever he needed money, he knew where to go. He just spoke and knew what to do. Because the word has power over everything. You have everything. You have access through the word of God to all spiritual blessing. And Psalms 19, this is the very last verse. Let me read this and then we can close with a word of prayer. Psalms 19. That verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So, may the Lord bless you. That is the power that is in the word to change us and to help us know our purpose, know the purpose of God in our lives, have the viewpoint, the proper perspective of God and what he requires of us. It gives balance to our lives and it has the transformative power to change us, that we, not con that we no longer conform to the patterns of the world, but are transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may be able to know God's will, which is good, pleasing, and perfect, and be able to receive eternal life, which is what we are all looking to. As we wait for our Messiah, may the Lord bless you so much. Let's close with a word of uh, <coughs> a prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, we honor you.
We give you praise, O God, for your word. For Lord God Almighty, in your word there is power to change our thinking, to give us the proper perspective of life. I pray, my God, for all who are hearing, O God, that have not yet have ignored your word, that have been distracted from your word, that have been deceived, O God, by false teachers and doctrines. Lord, I pray that shall, O God, O God, be able to speak to your people, to reveal the truth, the secrets of the kingdom, that they may know the word of God, and the word of God shall change and transform them, and give them the light, O God, to their pathways, to know the way of truth, to know the word of God. I pray for the servants of God, Lord God Almighty, that they rightly divide this word, that, Lord, which is profitable, Lord, for teaching in doctrine, and, O God Almighty, is, 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 is good for rebuking and training in righteousness. Father, I pray that, Lord, you shall help each and every person to find time, to spare, set apart time in their daily lives, O God Almighty, to study the word, that they may be able to receive knowledge and, O God, be able to partake your divine nature and, O God, to be able to receive the gift of salvation and eternal life. Father, I thank you as I pray for those who are yet to know you as Lord. The Lord God Almighty, you shall, O God, speak to their hearts. Lord God Almighty, that the yokes of the enemy shall be broken and your people shall be set free from deception and false religions. And Lord God Almighty, the destruction that is in the world, the Antichrist system that has, O God, that we are seeing, take, O God, come around. I pray that, Lord God Almighty, you shall give them the understanding of truth to be able to resist the schemes of the enemy. Lord, receive the praise, receive all the glory. For we thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. So the Lord bless you so much. Uh, thank you. See you next time.